So some people have said some really not so nice things about Do Not Track. Um, I'm really fond of what the Wall Street Journal's editorial board said. Most of the people who support Do Not Track aren't actually old enough to be Naderites, um, but nonetheless they termed us such. Uh, and some people have said some really nice things about Do Not Track. Um, the EFF, the ACLU, uh, FTC uh, commissioners, and FTC staff, uh, staffers in commerce, staffers in the White House. And so my hope is to give you a familiarity with this overall debate. The talk is going to proceed in four parts. Uh, first, I'm going to review the, the history of web tracking and how we got to where we are and where we are. Second, I'm going to talk about technology issues in this space. So technologies that are used for tracking and technologies that can be used to counteract tracking. Third, I'm going to talk about policy issues. So uh, how those technologies for counteracting tracking might be linked up to policy to make them more effective and how, uh, how, the, uh, how the economic impact of those technologies might or might not uh, be significant. And last, I'm going to give a concluding note on politics and whether any of this is even remotely feasible uh, or, or whether it's all just a bunch of West Coast hippies thinking up ways to break the internet. Okay. Uh, I, I kid you not, by the way, early on in the debates over do not track, there were industry lobbyists who claimed that the technologies that uh, we and others were proposing in the space would actually break the internet, like it would stop working. Um, testified before that before subcommittees in the House. Uh, okay. So, beginning with the history and status quo, um, in the beginning of the web, websites were static. So it was a bunch of text, uh, some, some links to other websites. Um, here was Tim Berners-Lee's original drawing in 1989, so it was a bunch of documents that pointed to each other. Um, 1992, the first graphical uh, web browser and the, fir the first website there. Um, so, so not a lot of interactive content, um, pretty straightforward static content. Um, in fact, if you were really cool, you could have an image on your website. Uh, there were these marquee and blink tags, thankfully now gone. Um, you could scroll stuff side to side and flash it at the user, and that was about it. But that didn't last very long. In 1994, Netscape uh, added the ability to store state in the browser, so you could save a little bit of text into the browser and replay it the next time the browser visited a website. And in 1995, Netscape added JavaScript to their browser. Um, this is a, a technology that allows running applications within the context of the browser. So by 1995, browsers could save information and they could run applications from anywhere. And that, of course, introduced some privacy problems. Of, just about any website has the ability to save information and run code within your browser. And in 1997, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, one of the web standards bodies, recognized this and put out a standards document saying, hey, web browsers, you have to be very careful here. There's a tremendous privacy risk, and you need to make sure to protect your users. And at the time, some web browsers did take some steps. You may recall that back in the day, there were permissions dialogues for cookies. You had to make it go away. And you could say, you know, remember to allow cookies. Or, uh, some browsers would block cookies from sites other than the ones they visited, um, third-party domains. So if you went to, uh, for example, the, the Yahoo website, you might block a cookie that came from Yahoo.com. You might block a cookie from something else.com. Um, but, but that, too, didn't last long. In fact, uh, by the end of 1998, every single web browser accepted every cookie and, uh, um, and, uh, and ran every script by default. So, so no warning dialogues, no asking for permission. Not coincidentally, in 1997, the very first <coughs> advertising company dedicated to taking advantage of the ability to, to store content and run code on any website uh, came into existence, DoubleClick in New York, based on the premise that if you could follow users across multiple websites, you'd be able to draw inferences about their interests and target ads based on those inquiry interests. So that was 1997. Um, give or take a few hundred years ago in, in electronic time. Uh, okay, so this is today. Uh, this is the New York Times website, something you might see in the morning. Um, or if you're a conservative, you might see this. Uh, people in DC really don't think that one's funny, by the way. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll stick to the New York Times for simplicity. Um, and, and it looks like the New York Times. It says the New York Times in that iconic font. It's got New York Times articles. It's got New York Times photos. It's got New York Times editorials and classifieds, all the local content. But it's not all the New York Times. In fact, lots of the stuff on that page is not at all served by the New York Times. The ads are served by a separate company. The images and video are served by separate companies. The social content off to the side, that's served by Facebook. Um, 
And then, of course, there's loads of content served by entities other than the New York Times that you can't even see. So here's my favorite example of embedded third-party content. This is a page on the UK's National Health Service. <laughs> right, so they maintain a bunch of disease pages so you can learn about various medical conditions. And here, Facebook learns when you go to research a disease. Uh, thankfully, no longer the case, but apparently five people like syphilis. <laughs> and so here's the core privacy concern. Now, whenever you go to a website, a bunch of companies learn about your visit to that website. So, so to be clear, the, the, the URL that you are at, that, that HTTP colon slash slash thing in the, in the bar at the top of your browser, that gets sent to a bunch of different companies. And they have the ability to associate uh, with which sites you move across over time. In a recent study, the Wall Street Journal found that the average property website had about 64 different tracking technologies on it for keeping track of the URLs you move across over time. And so in the first instance, this allows companies to collect your browsing history, that list of URLs and when you visit it. And from there, it doesn't take a lot of inferences to figure out health information, financial information, shopping history. At a first pass, if you go to a health or finance or shopping site, it's really easy to make an inference. And then, of course, with data mining, it's you, you can draw even further inferences. And just to be clear, very often, this information is identifiable or even identified. Um, the claim gets made quite a bit by representatives of uh, the, the advertising industry or companies in the third party space that this is all anonymous and so we don't really have to worry. Uh, in fact, the claim that it's all anonymous and we don't have to worry um, has attracted so much attention it made the cover of Time Magazine where there was uh, an article where the, the author drew the conclusion that when he looked at the information that was collected about himself, he was a lot less concerned, because his name was not. It was just some rough inferences about himself. And the first pass response I want to give here is a really nitpicky technical one that actually matters, that it's all pseudonymous. Now let me explain what pseudonymous is. In an anonymous system, if I go and tell you who I am right now, and then I walk away, come back later, you have no idea who I am, right? Completely blank face. In a pseudonymous system, uh, if I go and tell you who I am now, I can associate that information not only now, but with interactions in the past, interactions in the future. So here's an example. You might know a person, or you might have met a person recently who you'd seen around before. You recognize their face. And you can now, of course, retroactively say, oh, I saw this person on these prior occasions where I didn't know their name but now you can associate that name with those interactions. So that's pseudonymy, and that's why pseudonymy is so fragile. Because if identity gets associated once with a user in a pseudonymous system, you can associate present, past, and <coughs> future activi uh, activities with that identity. So there are about five ways in which identity can get associated with a pseudonymous browsing history. Um, one is there are some companies where it's not even a debate whether they know who you are. Uh, for example, Facebook makes no secret of that. They customize their third-party content, the like button, their comments widget, and so on, based on your identity. So they say, here are your friends, here's stuff your friends liked, um, and, and, and that's part of their business model. Uh, there are some third parties that are in the business of buying your identity. So you may see every so often these surveys that pop up on the web and say, you know, enter for a chance to win some, some iPod or some, something else in a raffle. And Oftentimes, those surveys uh, will feed identifying information to a third-party advertising company. So they'll take that information, um, use it to match up uh, your identity against one of these offline consumer databases, and then use that information to target ads to you. Uh, there's another problem where uh, websites will unintentionally tell third-party companies identifying information about you. Let me get to that in a second, so you're going to study on it. Um, a fourth way, there are some security exploits you can use. I wish I could say that third-party companies are above using security exploits, um, but that turns out to not be the case. And, and last, there are uh, a whole class of de-anonymization techniques in computer science where you take a bunch of data that doesn't have an identity associated with it and a bunch of data that does have an identity associated with it, and you statistically merge the two. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of any of that, but I just wanted to make it very clear that there are a lot of ways in which this is identifiable or already identified information. And on unintentional leakage in particular, we ran a study 
uh, where we signed up at 185 popular sites to see how much identifying information leaks. Um, so the, the way leakage works in most cases is the URL you're on will have your profile name, your username, or your user ID stuffed in it somewhere, uh, and that's enough to, to learn quite a bit about you in most cases. Uh, and so we saw a lot of this username and user ID leakage. Um, Scorecard Research, they're an audience measurement company, got username and user ID on 44% of the sites we tested. Um, Google also got it quite a bit, Quantcast, an analytics company. Um, so username and user ID is leaking all over the place. We saw a bunch of instances of even more clearly identifying information leaking unintentionally. So for example, if you type the wrong password on the Wall Street Journal's website, that sent your email address to a good number of companies. Uh, if you type, uh, or if you uh, click the local ad on the Home Depot website, that's like your first name and email address to quite a few companies. So there, there, there's a lot of unintentional leakage here too. So that is all to say that in practice, if a third party company wanted to figure out who users are, odds seem to be very good that that would be a trivial thing to do. And there are a bunch of reasons you might be concerned with companies you've never heard of, many times very small startups don't necessarily have a lot of market pressure to get things like security right. There are a lot of reasons you might be concerned about them having a sizable proportion of your browsing history. Um, here are just some of the concerns that have been raised by uh, civil society advocates, consumers, regulators, um, and many other stakeholders in this space. And setting aside the specific concerns, there's pretty robust survey data that users really don't like this. My favorite survey in this space was this collaboration between Berkeley and UPenn, uh, where they did a, a phone sur survey of a couple thousand Americans, and found that over 80% thought this stuff should be illegal in the first place. And over 90% thought that if they opted out, that it should have to stop, um, that the company should have no escape valve, this should be a legally binding opt-out. Okay, so that's where we are now. Next I'm going to move to technology. And first, Tracking technology. Broadly speaking, there are two types of tracking technologies. Uh, those that are staple, that is those that rely on slapping a virtual barcode on your browser, uh, and tracking technologies that are stateless, where you look at features of a web browser that taken together are sufficient to make that web browser fairly unique. And in the jargon of this field, it's a, it's a really jargon rich field, a lot of colorful, colorful stuff. Um, Staple tracking is often called tagging or super cookies. Uh, stateless tracking, often called fingerprinting, is my personal favorite. Um, if you use one of these technologies to recreate an HTTP cookie, the ordinary cookie you've heard of uh, all the time, that, that type of technology, um, then it's called a zombie cookie because it gets resurrected. Uh, at any rate. So I want to give a, a quick overview of some of the stateful tracking technologies. So, so these, are, these are just some of them. Um, these are places where your browser might save some information over time uh, associated with the website. And I want to be very, very clear that all of these technologies have really useful purposes. Um, so cookies, for example, they let us do things like build shopping carts or retain logins. They're great. Um, uh, HTTP STS over there, that's a, a, a new standard that allows a website, like a, a bank, to say only communicate with me over an encrypted and authenticated connection. So these, these are great technologies for the web. Um, but any place you can store some information in the browser, you can also store a virtual barcode that you can use to track a browser across websites. And in practice, we've seen a number of companies using combinations of these technologies to do just that. So for example, a team at Berkeley recently discovered an analytics company called Kissmetrics using all the technologies I put in red boxes there. We, this past summer, uh, found another company using um, those two technologies. The first one is like a version numbering system. So a, a website can say, this is version number such and such of this web page, and your browser can say, here's the latest version I have. Do I need to download the new one? Um, and instead of using that system for versioning, that website was using that system to store a user ID. Uh, that website was uh, one of Microsoft's. So uh, these are not just small companies <coughs> that are using these technologies. Um, I, I want to give a special note on, on this technology over here. Um, so your browsing history can actually be used to, to recover information about what you do on other sites or encode a user identifier. Um, we found a, a company this past summer that was using browsing history to learn about 
uh, what users had done on other sites. I, I want to walk through how this exploit works so you get an idea of the lengths to which companies are willing to go to learn about users. Um, so, so you may recall on websites that aren't overly well styled um, that links that you haven't clicked are blue. Right? You never know how good a projector is going to be. So. <coughs> And of course, if you have clicked a link, then it turns purple. And, and in fact, much of the early web looked like that. Looked like that. So this company was generating about 15,000 invisible links, and then asking your browser over and over again, is it blue or is it purple? And these were links to things like the back taxes page on irs.gov, uh, information about getting pregnant or whether you, um, whether you were uh, entering menopause, like sites like the Mayo Clinic, National Institutes of Health, um, University of Maryland hospitals. Um, so, so this was a, a large advertising network that was doing this. Um, we'll see if the Federal Trade Commission decides to enforce against them. Um, but at any rate, I think it's very clear that companies are willing to push the envelope of what would seem acceptable to learn about users. Now shifting gears to stateless technologies, um, here are some of the things you might measure about a web browser that taken together could actually be pretty unique. So for example, the, the list of fonts you have installed can actually become pretty unique, or which plugins you have installed, what version numbers they are, what content types they're set to, to run on, how large your screen is, and what resolution you run it at. Um, that can all, taken together, actually be more than adequate for tracking your browser. In fact, there are a bunch of companies that now have business models dedicated to tracking browsers just using this approach. And they like to tell how much more effective it is than standard <coughs> HTTP. And I want to note, just to be very clear, how difficult it is for users to control these technologies. Um, the moment uh, some script runs in your browser, it can do all of this. It can access all of these properties, bundle them up, and send them off to a website. It doesn't require you to save a cookie. It doesn't require uh, any other cookie-like technology. There's no virtual barcode involved. It's just measuring things that your browser makes available. And so that's, in the end, my thesis about all of this. That the very technologies that make the web so totally awesome are the ones that enable tracking. That we're not about to get rid of any of this stuff. They all have really important, valuable uses. But at the same time, we have to accept that there are negative privacy consequences associated. And so when it comes to technologies that put users in the driver's seat, at least today, uh, very often those anti-tracking technologies reduce just down to blocking. That there are technologies that allow users to prevent content from third parties from loading in the first place in their browser so that they can't do any of these stateful technologies, use any of these stateful technologies, and they can't use any of these stateless technologies. And there are a bunch of products in the blocking space. Um, Adblock Plus, the most popular add-on for Firefox, very well known. Uh, Microsoft added a blocking feature in Internet Explorer in the latest version, nine, version 9. There, there are a bunch of extensions that, that, that will do this. Um, and here's an example of what one of these lists looks like. Uh, so it's actually a list of rules of if some content has a URL that looks like this, don't load it. Um, so, so these rules are you know, tens of thousands of lines long. Um, and, and someone has to maintain these lists because, of course, websites change all the time. And that's why many have referred to this approach, this blocking, uh, this, these attempts at blocking is something of a cat and mouse game or an arms race because uh, there's this perpetual third parties add new content and block lists have to be updated. Some new technology will come into play and folks who are building block lists will try to have to catch something else. Uh, and I don't mean to be overly critical of block lists. They are valuable. They are the best tools we have right now. And they do guarantee the companies uh, it, they do, to a large degree, guarantee that companies aren't tracking you because your browser isn't even talking to those companies. Um, but there are a lot of problems with block lists. First, they're not in the slightest comprehensive. They only have what's on the list. Uh, second, they require updating. So if the block list you're subscribed to um, doesn't, uh, doesn't have uh, some, some new tracker, you need to make sure that that list is updating to, to get that new tracker. Uh, third, it breaks stuff. So um, if you want to prevent Facebook from tracking you through the like button, that means you're going to have to start blocking the like button. And as one of my colleagues in, in, in the uh, security lab once put it, any solution that blocks that, that breaks the like button is no solution at all. Uh, last, uh, it requires users to have some knowledge about who's making these block lists so they can make a good choice about which they install. And this, I think, is, in the end, the, the fatal flaw 
for the block list approach. Here are some claims that are made by some providers uh, of some of these blocking tools. Um, so, so Appian claimed that their tool was updated weekly, but that's actually not really the case. Um, the, these, this easy privacy list that completely removes all forms of tracking from the internet. Um, anyone who's familiar with internet engineering will tell you that's just not the case. Um, uh, trusty, uh, and we get back to them in a second. Uh, it says, helps users get good ads without compromising personal privacy. What helping users get good ads means, I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> and so we did this study where we crawled the Alexa top 500 US websites a few times with each of these tools installed to see how they perform. And they were all over the map. Um, the most effective tool was provided by what, as best I can tell, is an anarchist collective in New Zealand, uh, <laughs> represented by a guy wearing a gas mask uh, and, and, and it's in fact not just one list, it's a combination of three lists. Um, and, and it's worth noting that all of the top performing tools, by the way, are, are, are also ad blockers. Um, it's the very same content that loads in your browser that is used to track, uh, that, that is also used to deliver uh, advertising. So if you want to block tracking, you also have to block advertising. Now, I said I'd reserve the, uh, the trusty example, because this one's really fun. So trusty, uh, has a block list that in practical effect is mostly an allow list. That is to say, it will override any other block lists you have installed to allow certain large third-party trackers to track you. So not only do you have to get right the companies you trust, but you have to not actually install lists from untrustworthy companies because those will override the lists from the trustworthy providers and mitigate the privacy protection. And so, in sum, I think we just can't expect the average users to sort this out. It's not a usable set of privacy tools. Uh, they're not easy to install. It's not easy to learn how to get, how to, how to pick the right ones. Um, there's all sorts of bold claims around them. And so, while power users certainly have them as a resource for now, um, they're just not enough. The other broad set of solution that's been uh, advocated by, by folks in, in the third party business um, are these opt-out cookies. The largest organization providing opt-out cookies is the Network Advertising Initiative. That's about 70 companies. There's a dual of the Network Advertising Initiative, the Digital Advertising Alliance. Uh, you may see them in, the, in the print sometimes. Um, they're, they're largely similar commitments. Um, so about 70 companies participate in, in this program. Um, and the idea is that you will go to some website uh, select the companies you would like to opt out of. Uh, that will set cookies for those, those websites that you've chosen to opt out of. Um, and then those cookies will signal to those websites whenever your browser communicates with them that you opted out of them. Uh, you will note that I have carefully not defined what opt out means yet. Um, and there are a bunch of technical reasons why this is just not really a good idea. Uh, as one Stanford computer science professor put it, um, when I asked him what he thought of the opt-out cookie approach, he said, why the hell would you do that? Um, so, so the first problem is it's not comprehensive. Um, so not every third-party company offers these cookies. So you, you can only opt out of those that choose to participate. And the vast majority of companies, in fact, don't participate in, in these opt-out programs. Uh, they also require updating. So if a company uh, decides it, it uh, no longer wants to participate, or a new company participates, you have to make sure your cookies are uh, are, are set to the latest values. Um, cookies can also expire. So there's an ad network called Chitika that was setting opt-out cookies that lasted for only 10 days. So you had to make sure to go to Chitika's website every 10 days to keep your opt-out in place, uh, otherwise it would vanish. Uh, the FTC actually forced to get to that, so hopefully ad networks aren't doing that anymore. Uh, and last, of course, and this is a really big problem, you can accidentally clear them. Um, many users, uh, either themselves or through uh, through uh, uh, antivirus or privacy suites, will clear their cookies regularly uh, in a move to, attempt to preserve privacy. Um, and of course, that very move to preserve privacy blows away tracking cookies um, that, that might be used to follow a user around the web, but it also blows away these opt-out cookies. And so in attempting to preserve privacy, a lot of users are just going to shoot themselves in the foot and get rid of this opt-out that they did say. Those last two have an asterisk there because they're browser extensions offered by some uh, some organizations and some companies that mitigate those concerns. 
Of course, once something is moved into a browser extension, um, it starts to be a lot less easy to use. You have to go to some website that offers this extension, so you have to know if the extension exists in the first place, uh, install it, in some cases configure it. Um, so not, not the most user friendly. Uh, there's another component of this opt-out cookie model, this ad choices icon, which you may have seen in the corner of some ads. It, it looks like that and often has the text ad choices. Uh, when initially proposed, uh, all of this was uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 18 point font. It was about a 30 by 30 logo. Um, but the logo was actually a little more descriptive. The text said something like about interest targeted advertising. So you actually got an idea of what this was about. Um, but then some advertising folks went to implement this and said, gee, it takes up way too much space. So let's maybe not show the text all the time. Um, and then, gee, it seems like that logo is really big, so let's shrink it down some. Uh, and so by the time all was said and done, there is now a 15 by 15 pixel little triangular play button with an eye in it. Uh, in some portion of ads you see, some of them will say ad choices um, next to it. Um, and, and if you click that, it doesn't even take you to the opt-out page where you can set these opt-out cookies. It takes you to a page um, provided by some intermediary company, uh, which may not even have a link to the opt-out cookie page. Um, in some cases, it takes you just to a privacy policy that's uh, you know, dozens of pages long. Um, there was a great study recently out of Carnegie Mellon looking at one of these opt-out pages, and it found that one user who actually tried to exercise all the opt-outs on that page, I think it took them over 75 minutes to do all the opt-outs. So we were curious, given how unusable this thing seems in the first place, let's see if we can take a first pass at figuring out if it even shows up. And it turns out it doesn't. Um, that only 10% of third-party display ads even have this little blue play button with the icon in the corner. Only 5% have the text ad choices. And if we know users don't read privacy policies, uh, we know that users don't generally look at ads, why on earth would we think the little blue play button in the corner of an ad would at all give users some sort of relevant information level of control over third-party traffic? But enough railing about this dumb icon thing. Um, setting aside all of those problems, the opt-out cookie model has nothing to do with privacy. Uh, when you get an opt-out cookie, the promise that the company that serves that opt-out cookie uh, delivers is that it won't target ads. Not that they'll stop tracking you, that they'll stop using the tracking information they collect to show you a more relevant ad. And that seems totally ass backwards to us. Because there are in fact good privacy preserving ways of delivering interest targeted advertising. The problem here is that these companies you haven't heard of, or small companies, or companies that aren't under any pressure to get things right, have access to your browsing history. It's not that you happen to see an ad for cat food because you own a cat. Um, and for a long time, I and others in this space tried to say things to coax in industry into reforming their system in a way that was a little more privacy protective. We'd say things like, well, you almost got it right. Maybe this is a little misleading, but you could with a little bit of effort, maybe move this system in a more privacy-preserving direction. Um, and I think most have given up on that. This system is totally deceptive. Uh, it is designed to mislead regulators and legislators into thinking the industry has done something about privacy when it hasn't. Um, we actually ran a study early this summer looking at what companies do when you get their opt-out cookies. And about half of the companies we studied in the NAI left the tracking cookie in place after you opted out. Um, so companies do take advantage of the fact that they are not bound by an obligation to not target it, uh, but to stop tracking you. And in fact, it's so deceptive that sometimes big companies that are members of these uh, self-regulatory groups themselves get to see it. So here's one of my favorite examples, the Google Public Policy Blog. They released this tool called Keep My Opt-Outs. That's a tool for setting and maintaining these opt-out cookies. Um, and, and it turns out, they, they claim that it lets you opt out from, from ad tracking cookies, and that's actually not true. Uh, it lets you opt out from having ads targeted to you based on your interest. It has nothing to do with opting out of cookies. Um, and, and while I'm at, in, in this mode of saying how much I think self-regulation is total bunk, I'm going to add w one last piece here, which is one of the few things self-regulation is supposed to get right uh, is that sensitive medical and financial information shouldn't be accessible. Uh, to companies in this space, but in fact the language used for defining sensitive medical and financial information is, is very narrow. So medical information is a specific diagnosis uh, and financial information is a specific account number. So anything else is totally fair game. 
Um, if you're looking for a marvel of legal drafting, I encourage you to take a look at the self-regulatory documents. If you hear about it sometimes in law school, you can actually see an example of a double carve-out in the wild where they'll say something like, there is no tracking allowed, and then there is all <laughs> tracking allowed, and then we're going to accept these small use cases uh, for personalizing ads. So, um, so I don't think that works, in case that wasn't clear by now. And so to put a cap on that topic, I want to, I want to make clear that I think this is privacy theater. You may have heard the term security theater. Things like, for example, um, often airport security often criticized for being less about substance and more about the appearance of security. Um, here I think this is a great example of privacy theater, where this is a system designed to make it look to regulators, to legislators, to media and other stakeholders like this is an industry that's doing something when in substance, this is an industry that's doing absolutely nothing to put users in the driver's seat. Okay, so enough about the current industry system. Uh, you're all here to learn about Do Not Track. Uh, and Do Not Track is not just a technology, it's a, it has technology and policy components. So I'm gonna talk about technology now and get to the policy side in, in a minute. Um, so, as a matter of technology, Do Not Track is designed around three features. Uh, the first is it should be universal. So if you want to opt out of third-party web tracking, you opt out of all third-party web tracking, not some third-party web tracking, just the companies that choose to participate in some self-regulatory thing or that happen to have a cookie configured or happen to be on the block list. Second, that there shouldn't be any update that you can express your preference once and it's persistent. That preference is not going to go anywhere, that it's going to remain universal. And last, that it should be one click. You shouldn't have to take 75 minutes to opt out of every single company that chooses to provide an opt-out. It should be very simple. This is my preference with respect to privacy, and that's that. And the technology we and others have advocated for is a way to implement that kind of, this kind of privacy trust mechanism is a very simple HTTP header. So that is nothing more than a signal that comes from your web browser and goes to a website. This is, in fact, all it looks like going over the network. So this is what you need to do to get a PhD at Stanford these days. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, there are in fact three of the four major web browsers that now support Do Not Track. Uh, Chrome, the notable, uh, notable holdout at this point. Um, Firefox has had support for the longest, and now they have this really great user interface um, to show just how easy you can make this for users. All it is is in the privacy menu, right there at the top, there's a checkbox that says, tell websites I don't want to be tracked. And that's it. Um, and in fact, Do Not Track isn't just some hypothetical technology, some proposal from, from a lab. There are over 10 million people who are using Do Not Track right now. Um, the adoption rate in Firefox for Android was somewhere in the ballpark of 17% of users. Um, so by way of comparison, as best I can tell, the industry doesn't make the numbers public. That's give or take two orders of magnitude greater than the number of users who are using the opt-out system that the industry currently does promise to do something. So, user interface and usability matter hugely here. Um, and, and, and I think it's very clear that this is a much more promising direction. So in terms of what it takes to support Do Not Track, um, I, you don't have to worry about what this means, um, but I just wanted to make it very clear that it doesn't actually take much for a website to support, at least at a technology level. Um, that is all of the code you need to support Do Not Track in a very popular uh, language for building websites. So that's it. Uh, this doesn't break the web. This is, in fact, using a very standard web technology that gets used all over the place. But unlike blocking, Do Not Track has this problem of <coughs> websites have to promise to comply, but it doesn't actually do any enforcement of its own. It's a signal that gets sent out in the ether. Um, and some criticize Do Not Track for not being enforceable. I don't agree with that criticism. Uh, it's a different kind of enforcement. It's the kind of enforcement we use most of the time in law and uh, and in some other technical circumstances, it's ex post enforcement, where we out of band try to detect violations and then go after violators. And there are broadly speaking two technical ways in which you might try to do that. Uh, the first is you could try to observe suspicious behavior by third party websites. Um, uh, I and others in the security lab worked on a set of technologies that allow us to do this. That's, it's built, it works. That's how we found a bunch of the stable tracking technologies in use over the past summer. Uh, and that's also how we found uh, two companies that were actually supporting Do Not Track, even though they hadn't been public about it. Um, and then the other broad technical approach is you could observe ad distribution. So you could try to see if ads 
uh, or other contents being personalized um, to the user. There's a little bit of early academic work on this. It's not really clear how well it, it, it would work. Um, but anyway, the first approach is very promising, already works in practice. So that's all I wanted to say about technology. Uh, I'm glad to see I didn't lose uh, too many people from the room I'm in that section. Uh, so in the policy section, the first thing I want to talk about is what does do not track mean? That, that thing I held off while discussing the technology, because of course, once you've established the signal, then a website has to know what it actually has to do to comply with the signal. Um, and and it, the claim gets made quite a bit in the debate over third-party web tracking that this is all murky, there isn't a clear definition, um, to the effect of, I don't know what do not track means. Um, to apply the uh, age-old adage that if a company says something once, um, then it's just some boy talking, twice coincidence, three times it's a company talking point. Here are three times someone senior at Google has said, we don't know what do not track means. So that, that is Google's current talking point and position on do not track. <coughs> and I think that's just not right. I think there's, in fact, tremendously broad consensus about what do not track means. And I want to be clear here that when I say consensus, I'm talking about NGOs, civil society groups, um, many government regulators, many researchers and activists. I'm not talking about businesses. There is not a consensus that businesses agree with. So when a company says, I don't know what do not track means, I think that's more a euphemism for I don't like what do not track means. Uh, here are some organizations where I, I tried to do as best I could a comparison between approaches um, or, or individuals from those organizations, and the, the differences were relatively minute. Um, there's an organization, that, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, Web Standards Body, that is now working on a standards text for Do Not Track. Alicia is actually one of the co-chairs of that standards process. Um, and the differences are getting hammered out there. And in practice, it's become very clear that these organizations, the civil society, regulator, academics, activists, and so on, do actually have a huge amount of agreement. And there are deep divides with where they think Do Not Track should go and where members of industry think Do Not Track should go. But that's a very big difference between, there's a big, very big difference in that not knowing what do not track means. So I'm going to do my best here to give a view that I think roughly encapsulates where this, this consensus among these organizations goes. It's a consensus guided mostly by user expectations. That's the touchstone of all this. Um, anyone who's taken a point of memory class is probably going to open their eyes at this point. So when we say third party tracking, that requires defining well, what's a third party? That is, what, what are the interactions we're really concerned about? And what's tracking? What are the things that they do that we want them to stop doing if the user turns on do not track? And in thinking about what a third party is, the first observation I want to give is that it's a role, not an entity. So a company like Facebook is a first party when you're at Facebook.com using the website, posting stuff to your wall. And it's a third party when there's a Facebook like button embedded on another website. So the very same businesses uh, can, be, can be both. Uh, and second, there is no technical bright line. There is no easy solution, some, some technical rule we can develop here. Um, so to give two counter examples, first, um, Amazon serves a bunch of its content from Amazon, AWS.com, totally controlled by Amazon, just happens to be where they locate some of the resources. Um, I think it would be very silly to say we're going to draw a line there because Amazon happens to have architected its web properties in this way. At the same time, things can look like they belong to a first party and not. So uh, I'm sure most are familiar with this website. Um, that also looks like it should be controlled by Apple. Uh, but it turns out it isn't. That's actually uh, a domain that points to a server controlled by Adobe. Um, so they provide analytics to the apple.com website. Um, so domain names alone are not enough to solve this. And so where we came out, and it taught computer scientists in all sorts of knots, was, well, let's do some sort of uh, balancing test. And that's going to have to be based around user expectations. There's no easy way around it. First parties are who users expect to interact with, and third parties are websites users don't expect to interact with. And this seems to be the direction that W3C is actually going in right now. Um, it's not the traditional direction that things like web standards have gone in, but there is no easy way to do it. But that said, to the extent this seems fuzzy, the good news is 99% of the cases are remarkably and so by going with the standard, while that makes there some play in the joints for the 1%, so let's say if you're on the Wall Street Journal's website, is News Corp also a first party or a third party? Because there's a cor corporate relationship there, some people might know, Wall Street Journal's owned by News Corp. Um, 
that's, that's independent, that's a relatively narrow set of use cases versus the much more prolific tracking that goes on by advertising companies, analytics companies, and others that are more professional with their parties. So as for what tracking is, um, the, the view that I think this consensus group has uh, is that it means everything. Uh, anything you collect or keep around or use, that, that is tracking the user. And then we're going to have to very carefully define some exceptions. I think this is also the direction that W3C is heading in now. Um, those exceptions get very hard to define. We've again proposed a balancing test that, once again, ties all sorts of computer scientists and all sorts of knots. Um, here's the specific test that we proposed. I'm not sure uh, where W3C is going to come out or if it's even just going to give a balancing test as against <laughs> saying here are the specific instances we're going to just say are exceptions. So here's an example of a place where an exception might make sense. Uh, there's a problem with financial services fraud on the web where someone will go and open a bunch of credit cards at a bunch of banks. Um, so if a company is only in the business of learning about did you open five credit cards in the past hour, the only information they have access to is yes or no, did you open a credit card on these websites? Um, that, and, and there's no other way to solve that problem. That might be something where we allow an exception. Uh, there's a really hard problem here around routinely logged data, so IP addresses, other things coming out of TCP IPs, so uh, network information, information associated with browser configuration that's not even actively uh, requested by the website. Um, there's some technical tools for dealing with these, um, but uh, it's not, uh, and some combination of these tools I think will ultimately be uh, where the W3C, uh, or, or uh, where the W3C recommends um, uh, what the W3C recommends websites should do when they get this information and users turned on do not track. Um, so, so that's the one big uh, unsolved problem. But the good news is we do have tools for addressing that problem. So we just have to decide how to use those tools. Okay, so that's it for the really dry do not track policy stuff. But it is important if you want to understand the do not track debate. And so now shifting gears to the other side of the policy section here. I wanted to uh, add a brief note about whether this is going to be lethal to ad-supported websites. Because it's no real secret that the ad-supported web is totally great. You get free webmail, you get free search. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, all sorts of ad-supported sites that just like, revolutionize the way people interact with information. And of course, we don't want any proposal here to negatively impact that ecosystem. And I think the answer is actually really clearly no. And I want to be very clear that I am saying it will not hurt companies that are ad supported. That is very different from saying it will not hurt advertising companies. If your company is in the business of behavioral advertising, um, do not track is probably going to be pretty bad for you. Um, but this is a, a, a problem that comes up a lot in tech policy in DC, where intermediaries will say this is bad for us, but really we don't care about the intermediaries. Uh, an example many may be familiar with are the copyright debates over music and, and movies where um, where production studios and recording industry, recording industry uh, players will say things like, this really hurts us, and people on the civil society and advocacy side will say, we don't care, we care about the music and the movies. Um, and so here it's important to keep that in mind. And there are a few, a few reasons why I think this is not really a problem for ad-supported sites, and I'm going to run that down very quickly. Um, first, we're talking about a very small share of online advertising. So, a bunch of online advertising isn't even provided by third parties, it's provided by first parties. So for example, Google's uh, search ads are served by Google, they're not served by another company. Um, and so that's not a problem. Facebook's ads are served by Facebook, not some other company. Um, or at least the ones that show up on the side of Facebook. So that's not a problem. Um, and, and in fact, uh, less than 5% of, of online advertising in the US, revenue I should say, is behaviorally targeted. So there are all these other ways of targeting ads, contextual targeting, that's what's, what website are you looking at. Uh, there's demographic targeting, so what does the audience for this website look like. There's geographic targeting, so where does this person seem to be coming from. And all, all the combinations of these, that it turns out are really effective. And there's very mixed evidence that behavioral targeting is actually even more effective than all of these other techniques. Uh, second, I want to note that behavioral advertising is actually a really new market segment. It wasn't until about 2007-ish that it started to become a, a sizable, or a, a, I shouldn't say sizable, a noticeable even proportion of the online advertising, uh, of online advertising revenue. Uh, third, a lot of users aren't going to turn this on. Remember, we're talking about an opt-out system here. Um, and, um, and, and so there's some proportion of users for whom this isn't even a concern. Uh, 
Um, there's elasticity in demand here without geeking out on economics. Um, a lot of industry analysis has said this many people are going to turn on do not track, so we wipe out that percentage of revenue. And that's, of course, not right. Um, if behavioral advertising gets more expensive or more difficult, companies may well shift to other forms of online advertising. Um, there's some technology fixes here. So it turns out that there are some technologies you can use for interest targeted advertising without violating user privacy. Um, we've worked in, on some in our lab. Uh, there are a bunch of other labs that have developed technologies like that. The, the general idea is you store information about your interests in, in your browser. Um, and that information gets computed on locally in the browser. It doesn't get sent to a website. And so that website can't actually learn. Uh, you, can, you can carefully get mathematical bounds on how much that website can learn about you. Um, and, and last, of course, even if all of that is wrong, like I'm just totally wrong on this topic, there's a great safety valve built into the system that if a website needs tracking to support itself, it can just say, please allow tracking to, to go to this website. Um, I, I think that's, there's some uh, internal resistance to taking advantage of that. No website, I think, wants to be in a position of, if you get my content, you have to give up your privacy. Um, but uh, if the economic impact is big, uh, they are able to do that. Okay, so that's it for policy. And now the very last uh, brief section on politics. Um, first, who I think should enforce this system, I think that's really clear. The Federal Trade Commission has been doing uh, nationwide consumer protection for a very long time. They've been staffing up quite a bit in technology. They now have um, uh, great internal resources and great relations with folks in civil society and academia. So they would definitely be able to enforce it in our track. And the very last thing uh, I'm, I'm, I want to talk about uh, is whether this is even going to happen. And I see three political playgrounds um, in which th this is possible. Um, th this could happen uh, at the federal legislature, it could happen at the state legislature, but let's be real, we're talking about California. Um, and last, it's possible this could happen in the EU. Um, and, and while none of these are totally off the table, I, I think it's fair to say a federal bill is probably not going to happen. Um, the tenor of conversations in House hearings, uh, and I say this in a purely nonpartisan sense, I'm just going to try to describe what I see. Um, the tenor of House hearings uh, among the lead Republicans on, in House Commerce and subcommittees of House Commerce has been, they agree that that, that self-regulation has not done enough, that this industry is doing things that cause privacy problems, but at the same time, um, they are very skeptical of economic impact, um, and they don't want to be in a position of adding regulatory burden to businesses. Um, so I, I think the federal legislation is probably not too great right now. Uh, state legislation is a total wild card, always hard to predict what's going to happen. There is a do not track bill in the California Senate, um, unclear if that's going to get resuscitated or a new bill or nothing's going to happen. State legislature, for example, there was a privacy bill that recently went up to Governor Brown's desk that he just decided he didn't like anymore and vetoed. Of course, something like that would never happen in the federal system. So, uh, so state legislature, very hard to predict. But the EU looks great. Uh, the EU has decided it wants to be a rock star on web privacy. Um, and in 2009, passed an amendment to this EU directive, the e-privacy directive, uh, saying not only um, is opt-out required for third-party tracking, something that had been on the books since about 2002 but never really enforced, um, but in fact they were going to flip the default and say opt-in consent is required before third-party tracking can happen. Um, so they're proposing an opt-in system. Um, and, and more recently, uh, commissioners in the EU have suggested that um, they would like their system to be linked up to do not track, be some sort of joint US EU system. If they decide to flip the default, so a user has to send a do not track opt in versus opt out signal, um, perhaps website by website, uh, that would be fine, but they want the two systems to be harmonized. Uh, and so um, because of that, it looks like there's a really good chance that do not track is going to happen. Um, and I think companies are going to be in a very difficult position if they want to say, we're going to support this technology for people in the EU, but we're not going to allow people in the US to make the very same privacy choices. Um, and so I think to, the, the odds of do not track actually look not too bad right now. So that covers all the topics I want to get through. I appreciate your patience. Uh, I know there was a lot of dense and technically dull stuff in there. Um, so that's the wrap. And I'm happy to open it up for questions. Uh, can these tracking cookies be used to, uh, to plant 
um, malware or to um, cause your computer to report all your actions from some point ever more forward? Uh, so, so there is a problem uh, in online advertising. Um, again, great point of journey, maladvertising, uh, where, um, where someone will buy a bunch of ads and stick malware. Uh, um, Google actually had a problem with this a, a year or two ago. Uh, some ads ran, I think it was the New York Times website that had malware. Um, that's a, a, a not particularly related issue. It's, it's an issue in online advertising, but I, I see that as a distinct issue. For Um, maybe I missed it, but did you address the cloaking features typified by Chrome's incognito mode? Uh, I, I didn't talk about them. Uh, if you're interested in what those features do um, and what they do and don't do to protect users against third party tracking, um, there's a, a post I did on the CIS blog that's a pretty thorough review of those features and other features in browsers, um, third party cookie blocking and others. Um, so many browsers implement private browsing very differently. Uh, so, for example, in Safari, if you have cookies from an advertising company um, and then turn on private browsing, those cookies stay in place um, and companies can still track them. Um, Chrome and Firefox do private browsing a little bit differently. Um, their stateful tracking technologies um, within a single private browsing session will continue to work outside of a private browsing session. Uh, should not work, but stateless technologies will continue to work. That is to say, it is a very convoluted topic. How does your do not track group specifically try to enforce the politics around this? Um, so we've had the good fortune to work with a, a bunch of folks in DC, um, House and Senate and the FTC and the White House. Um, I, it's kind of cool that folks are receptive to what a bunch of geeks have to say. Um, I, I think it's very clear that DC is not a town that has technical confidence. And a lot of civil, <laughs> civil society and government folks are desperate for technologists um, to, to come in and explain things. And, and I think uh, very often there, there is no need to even have some sort of activism role. Um, think claims like, for example, do not track or break the internet are just not technically true. Um, and the ability to explain in an even-handed way why that's the case, I, I think is great. And I think there's a lot of receptivity to it. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Jeff It looks like you advocated uh, to target based upon demographics. And uh, you sounded pretty racist. It means that all white should have been targeted for black tuxedo suits, and all Asians would be targeted for different kind of clothing. If you're just collect collecting demographics. Uh, so by demographic targeting, uh, what I meant is a very specific practice in online advertising, where a website will compile a profile of, on average, what its visitors look like, um, and then will allow advertisers to target based on that profile. Um, in some cases, you're absolutely right, but those profiles can raise real issues. Um, in some cases, they don't. Something like, for example, this is a website that happens to have a slight, slightly more wealthy audience, and so that might be a site that Rolex decides it wants to advertise on versus another. I think that raises substantially less concerns. Um, but, but anyway, uh, demographic targeting is a very specific business practice. Uh, if you're interested in it, I encourage you to read my blog post um, on advertising economics, uh, the CIS blog, that get, goes into some detail about how that works. Can you tell us which file contains the list of URLs that the browser has visited? Is it the same on all browsers? And isn't it obliterated when you close the uh, browser? And uh, you do this in the library? Does it give the uh, browsers give the URLs of the previous person who used the computer? Uh, so, how browser history uh, is browsing history stored varies by browser. Um, that's that's completely implementation specific. Uh, as for whether it sticks around over time, um, you can control in most in just about every web browser now, I believe, uh, how long that sticks around. You can certainly explicitly clear it. Um, as for whether in a in a library, uh, browsers are configured to do that. That's up to how the library chooses to configure uh, its browsers. Um, it's certainly the case that many libraries do not. Configure Thanks, fascinating. This is uh, an item in a history that begins at least with TCP IP and certainly the early 90s. Um, looking ahead um, 10 years, 
Uh, I'm developing world university and school like Wikipedia with MIT open course for potentially three to eight thousand languages, 200 countries. Um, is there a collaborative defining role um, 10 years out in um, possible uh, issues that emerge? Um, and uh, how will also Stanford's uh, sort of your, the part your do not track sort of focus here help define into the future, say 10 years out? So I think that's going to be a real challenge for the W3C forum, which is um, thankfully not my problem, uh, which, which is uh, uh, how, how to maintain this definition. Because it's certainly the case that a lot of the third party practices that happen now uh, are, are not business practices um, that existed even a few years ago. It may be difficult to remember that the, the Facebook like button is actually only a couple of years old. Um, so the, some of the most prominent third party content is very new. On, and so that may pose new issues. At the same time, um, I, I think the privacy concerns associated with the Facebook like button and other third party content like that happens to be very similar um, to, to behavioral advertising or any other third party content. Um, but at any rate, uh, there is definitely a need for ongoing dialogue. Uh, as for what role Stanford will have, uh, I guess I'm parked here for the next five years here until they kick me out. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I suspect that civil society groups and academics and activists uh, are, are going to remain engaged in the topic. This is not one that's going away. Uh, you talked about interest-based ads uh, and how some technologies allow that. I'm unclear about how that is not a violation of privacy. If you're serving interest-based ads, I, I think that <coughs> also violates privacy. I'm unclear how. Do not, why do not track these ads? Uh, so, so I think it's a question of what you conceive the privacy concern here to be. Uh, I think it's a very fair point that some people say, uh, I feel my privacy is violated when I see an ad that is based on stuff I've done before. Uh, I don't have that view. Uh, I think mean, many others and many other stakeholders in this debate don't have that view, but some do. Um, if you come at it from the perspective of the privacy concern here is that companies have your browsing history. Um, then there may be technologies that don't provide companies with your browsing history, but nonetheless enable some things like interest targeted advertising. Um, as for the specifics of those systems, we did a, a literature review of a bunch of approaches in that space on our website, do not track us. Funny but true, very quick anecdote. Um, when I explained that was our website to some folks at the Commerce Department, um, instead of saying, like, oh, it's so great you put together a web resource, they were like, huh, someone uses .us. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so check it out if you're interested in those technologies. Hi. Um, great talk. Um, interesting activity. Uh, I especially like the fact that you charted out how complex the problem space was and how complex the set of mechanisms are. Um, as for your comment that some of that uh, technical stuff was dry, I just don't understand that, but we'll go back on it. Um, so H.L. Mencken made a fairly important comment, which was incomplete complex problem, there's a simple solution, and it is wrong. Uh, the incomplete part is, or so are most of the complex solutions. My understanding is part of the training of being an attorney is being able to argue the other side. So my question to you is, have you, so much of the better, yeah. <laughs> ha have you gone through the careful and rather difficult exercise of exploring and understanding why most of what you're trying to do won't work? Um, yes. Uh, we have. Um, in fact, before we even said things publicly about Do Not Track for a few months, well, when we first started thinking about this mechanism, we now it seems to be some consensus building around, um, it, it did seem too simple to us and too elegant, and it didn't seem to us uh, that this, this could possibly be a, a comprehensive. I'm sorry, I actually think what you divide is pretty complicated. That's Just to be clear on that point. Okay. I don't think a simple solution will work either, but... Uh, but at any rate, this technical approach of an HDB header, we weren't sure that it would do what we wanted it to do. And so we made sure to circulate the idea through uh, uh, quite a few stakeholders in government and academia and so on uh, to make sure we weren't off our markers. Um, and subsequently, um, we, we actually have great, I, I should say, folks in the security lab here and stakeholders throughout the debate, especially now that W3C is one, have great relationships with each other. We all totally geek out about this stuff. I mean, how many people could you like, nerd out to about super cookies and so on? Um, and so uh, I think there is increasingly a very good appreciation uh, on both sides of where the other stands. Um, 
we've in particular tried to dig into some of the economic and technical arguments that were made. Um, we have uh, a literature review that's somewhat of an annotated bibliography that criticizes, um, and in some places um, uh, criticizes uh, some of the work that's been widely cited by the other side. So we have tried to engage quite as much as possible. And, and you documented this exercise where? Oh, on our website, do not track the us right down there. Uh, I think we're probably one of the only dot us domains. That is definitely the argument against it. All right, thank you very much for coming out.